So a few days ago, I posted a full playthrough of everything that Jim Mills plays on Little at a Time. And I've already been getting questions from people asking if they should learn everything on the recording, or why I chose that recording in particular, or how they can use that information to incorporate into their own playing. And we're gonna get into all of that, but first do me a huge favor and subscribe to this channel and like this video. It's one of the things that makes these videos possible and I really appreciate it. And I should also mention that if you want the tablature for this lesson and all of my lessons, then you can head to patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo. That's where I post tablature and bonus practice tips, live streams, all kinds of extra stuff that you can't find here on YouTube. Now, let's talk about why I would even want to learn something like this in the first place. The main reason is that if I want to become a bluegrass banjo player, then I really need to figure out what bluegrass banjo players do. So by learning everything that Jim Mills plays on this song, I'm leaving no stone unturned. I get to learn how he plays kickoffs and rolling backup and up the neck backup and vamping backup and even how he transitions between different sections. And once I learn all that, then I'm going to have a really clear picture of what my responsibilities are as a banjo player in a bluegrass band. People also asked why this song in particular and why this recording. And the first reason is that this is a really high quality recording and you can hear the banjo really clearly. Even though I had to slow down the recording a little bit just to be able to hear exactly which notes he was playing, the banjo is really clear in the mix. And that means that not only can you hear each individual note that's being played, you can also hear things like dynamics or rhythm, which arguably are as important as which notes to play if you want to be a really good bluegrass banjo player. And you're not going to hear this song that often on stage or at jam sessions, but that's okay because it has the exact same chord progression as a lot of other really common bluegrass songs, like Your Love is Like a Flower, for instance. So that means that everything that Jim plays on this song is directly applicable to those songs, or at least easily applicable to a lot of songs that include these chords, G, C, and D, which by the way, is most bluegrass songs. And this is really the big picture when it comes to learning bluegrass banjo or any genre. We're trying to use all the information that we learn in as many places as possible. We're trying to stretch that knowledge as far as we can. And that means that everything that I learned from this recording, I'm gonna try to apply to other songs that I play. So now let's talk about specifically what I learned from this process and from this recording. And then let's talk about how you can incorporate this material into your playing. The first thing that you can pull from a recording like this, which doesn't actually require that you really learn any of the notes that Jim plays, is when to play certain types of backup. In this case, Jim uses rolling backup through almost the entire recording, with two exceptions. During the second verse, he plays up the neck backup, and during the mandolin break, he plays vamping backup. And that's a really common way to handle different styles of backup during a song, because during the second verse, you'll get a little bit of a variation, and then during the mandolin solo, you can get out of the way and not cover up what the mandolin's doing during their break. When it comes to the actual material that Jim's playing on this recording, the first thing that I noticed is that it's all pretty simple. That doesn't mean it's necessarily easy to play, but he's got a few phrases that he uses over and over again that gives the whole recording a really consistent and cohesive sound. For instance, in his rolling backup, when he goes from G to C, he plays these four licks. They all sound great, and they're all really similar. In fact, they all include this really important and common transition lick from G to C. When he plays two measures of C, he only plays these two licks, and he only plays the second one once. And when he plays this really common 1-5-1 one, one progression, he usually just plays something like this. And occasionally he'll play a small variation like this. And when he plays two measures of D, he's really only playing these three similar licks. Then, during the second verse, he plays up the neck backup. And usually when we think about up the neck backup, we think about something like this.
And Jim frequently does play material like that, but in this case he plays much simpler. He plays basically one repeated pattern over each chord. Then, when he vamps during the mandolin solo, again he keeps it simple and he only vamps on beats 2 and 4. I'm sure he could and often does play more complicated vamping patterns, but in this case he wants to stay out of the way of the mandolin. So what does all of this mean? Well, the first thing is that it means you really don't need that many licks to play really great bluegrass banjo. I think there's a misconception that bluegrass banjo players have a gigantic library of licks and phrases, or they're constantly improvising, or that they're never really playing things the same way twice. And that can be true, but if you go back and listen to the recordings, you're going to hear a lot of the same licks over and over again. And it's not just because people don't have better things to play. Players like Earl Scruggs or J.D. Crow or Jim Mills know that if you keep it simple and play with good timing and good tone, you're putting yourself in the best position to support the singer or the soloist or the song in general. So here's the real truth about playing backup, and I assume that if you've stuck around this long in the video, then you want the truth. If you can't play simple rolling backup through songs with G, C, and D, like this one, with these kinds of simple licks, or ones from some of my more basic videos, then you really don't need to be learning new licks. And if these patterns are too difficult or too complicated for you right now, that's fine, at one point they were for me as well. And if that's the case, then you're just gonna to wanna to check out some of my other basic backup lessons. But whether it's in those lessons or the material from this lesson, this is all you really need to play good backup on a song in G position, which is most of what we end up doing as banjo players. So I would say this, I think you should prioritize a small amount of material and make sure that you can really play through a bunch of different songs using the same chords before you move on to play other more complicated licks that you might not actually get a chance to use all that often. So now we have some really great backup material, and the next step is gonna to be to apply it to other songs with different chord progressions. For instance, here's some backup on Roll In My Sweet Baby's Arms using only material from this recording that we've rearranged to fit the new chord progression. And here's some up the neck backup for Little Cabin Home on the Hill, again just using the material from this recording rearranged to fit that chord progression. I think it's a good idea to learn these versions of these songs using this material, but it's really important that you do some of this yourself. Take some of the songs that you're learning or that you're already playing and apply this material. If you do that, then you're gonna be able to make choices, otherwise known as improvisation. You're gonna be able to choose different licks at different times depending on what you think needs to be played. I hope you found this video helpful, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. I'll try to answer as many as I can. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.